Uh, Hebrews 10, 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, some have taken that and said, see, if you sin after you get saved, you're going to burn in hell. Okay? That's not what the, the key word here, and I believe in every word in the scripture, and I believe they mean something. The key word here is the word will. What is your will? What is your true desire? And let me sh let me show you what that let me show you what that looks like in in Romans Romans seven. Paul was talking about the dual nature that he had. Number one, Paul tells us. Number one, I have a thorn that I asked God to remove, and He said, "I'll just give you grace, which is better." God did not give Paul a no answer. What he gave him was something better. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, but I think I'm going to go a little bit longer today. Um, and, the, and the idea is, and now I'm going to say this, if you, any of you out there, have any kind of issue in life, I don't like the word addiction, because psychology says that it can cure addictions. I don't like that word. I think people have a sinful nature. They have a flesh that is rebellious and hates God. And it is unruly and it needs to be killed. That's what I think. If you've if you have, in, out of the sincerity of your heart, begged God in tears to take that away from you, and it isn't gone, what does that mean? What it means is, is that God decided that he can work with you better with that in your life in other words, God can God can keep you on your knees. That's what he that's what the Bible clearly is telling us that's what he was doing with Paul. Paul was Paul was saying I was so arrogant and cocky and so full of myself and then I run off of Jesus for 14 years and Jesus is teaching me doctrines that no one else ever heard of before. And then he's and I in my flesh, I would take that and go I'm high and mighty. But God gave me a thorn so that I don't do that. Um, the word will is, is rec I recognized it one day studying the, the book of Romans chapter 7. Listen to what uh, Paul says. You're going to hear the word will in a different form. Paul said in Romans 7.15, For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that was his will. Paul's will, his truest heart desire, was that he pleases God. He said, for, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate that do I if then I do that which I would not his will I consent unto the law that it is good in other words I don't want to break I don't want to break thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not covet I don't want to break that that's that's God's law when you sin willfully You've made a conscious decision that the law is not good. You don't care. There's no repercussions for me. I'm not going to go to hell. I think people made that up to scare people. And you just absolutely don't give a flip about what God thinks. Now your will is not directed toward 
wanting to be and please God and be with God and have a right relationship with him, your will is to quote the probably the most famous reprobate in the entire world, Aleister Crowley, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Does that make sense? Aleister Crowley's burning in hell right now. Why? Because of his will. So Paul said, if I do then that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it was good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, his thorn. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. I want to please God. I want his glory in my life. But how to perform that which is good? I find not. You know what I'm telling you know what I'm telling you, Jack? There's no psychologist or psychotherapist or psychiatrist or self help group or self help meeting that's ever gonna fix your problem and make you not ever do this again. It's not gonna happen. The Bible Reg Kelly taught me this. The Bible is not a self help book. It's not. It's not a self-help manual. It is a book that teaches us the condemnation of our sin so that you and I rely solely on God's work in our lives and never our own works. Never. I And I'll say this again. I... I believe that there are a lot of pastors out there. Maybe, maybe they just haven't really. I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I don't want to judge some good men. And maybe God. I don't know. There it seems to be. There's a lot of pastors out there that are using fear, enforcement, or whatever to make sure that no one ever sins. And even the Amish people sin. Um, I went to a very, very, very strict Bible college for one semester. They had rules that said a man, a young student, male student, could not ever be caught standing still with a girl on campus. They had to be walking to and from class or to and from the cafeteria or to and from the chapel. And then they had extremely strict codes on dating. You had to have you had to have chaperone, you had to go to somebody's house. I mean it was just they just and even if you went off campus, you had to notify the school, they had to know who was in your car. I mean extremely strict. Did you know that that didn't stop anybody from having sex at that school? Didn't stop a one. Um, let me let me try to finish reading this. Sometimes my mind tells me that I am truly that if I truly am saved and love the Lord Jesus, then I would seek to resist fleshly desires, no matter how strong they may be. And since I've been unable to, now I will say this: God is teaching you how to fight this stuff off. Okay, he's t that's that's what he's doing. That's Judges chapters one, two, and three. You go read it. You'll find it there. God is teaching you how to fight this stuff off. He is trying to strengthen you against these enemies. That I have no doubt. And over time, things will be better. Um. He said, then that must mean that I'm fooling myself into believing that I'm part of the family of Christ. I do try, but the temptation gets stronger and stronger until I finally give in. The Bible does say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And the scary fact is that uh, part of me wants to give in and part of me wants to uh, uh, wallow in this stuff. And then part of me, more often, that is not successful in overpowering the part of me that wants to please Christ. Why is this? Jesus said, the spirit truly is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. How can I minister to people about Christ when I myself am living in secret sin? Well, Jack, it's not really a secret. I mean, I'm not 
obviously nobody, you're not standing in a public pavilion. Obviously. Uh, you want to know how you can minister to people about Christ? Let me tell you what's in the law. According to the law, let's say a family, let's say that you, Jack, were a Levite priest. And a family shows up and they've got the county fair lamb. Because they're, they got they to keep the law. They, they got a family, they got a county fair lamb. I mean the prized lamb of their family. And they have to give this over for a sacrifice because they have sin in their life and then in their family. According to the law, you know what the priest had to do? Before the priest could offer a sacrifice for them, he had to go offer one for himself. You know what it was? God was making sure that the Levite priesthood never used their office and the charge that God had given them as a weapon to, to other people saying, oh, you're a sinner? Hmm. I'm a priest. I'm a Catholic priest. I don't have desire for women. I just like little boys. Catholic priests, Catholic priests are told that when they become priests, God immediately removes all that from them. That is the stupidest lie. And I'll, I'll say this to you. I think some of the best ministers in the world are people who have wrestled with sin dealt with it, had experience with it, fight it off. To me, the best preachers in the world are the humble guys who don't use the word of God and the preaching of God against sin as a weapon against people. Um, I'm going to move on here. Uh, how can I minister to people? Uh, we, if I'm really a son of God, would he, wouldn't he chastise me when I disobey? Absolutely. Could all these things be a concern to me if I tr wasn't truly saved? Listen, if you weren't truly saved, you would have never written me. You would have never written this letter. If you were not truly saved, you'd be playing the lie that most church people are playing. I come to church, I look Christian on Sunday morning, and then starting Sunday night, I'm right back into the sins, that I, and, I, and I don't care. All I care about is looking good Sunday morning. That's not you, Jack. Um, let's see. The, the, I'm, and I'm skipping over a lot of this, and I apologize. But anyway, however, despite everything, I give God thanks for what he through his mercy has shown me from his word. Um, anyway, let's see. I pray God allows me to finish his work. So I, did not, I didn't write this initially to send it to you. It was just typing down my thoughts, and then the thought came to send it. God told you to send this, Jack. I know you're busy and have a lot to deal with, but I would appreciate it if you could give your biblical response, and if you could spend a few minutes on your PMO broadcast to do so, I would be grateful. You have my permission to read it without giving my name, as I am sure there may be others that may be going through something similar to what I am. And you're, you're absolutely right, Jack. Let me read this one paragraph here. Sometimes I cry and beg for forgiveness for my sins, but then I turn around and do the same things as a few hours, days, or weeks later. How can this be? How can the same?